So, uh, hands up if you are a prayer master. It's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> Let's be honest. Um, we all at different times and in different ways struggle with prayer. All of us probably would say that we're students of prayer. Um, it, it's one of those parts of our Christian life which is a joy. It's one of the greatest privileges. But yet, it's, it's something probably all Christians feel I could do better. I could do better. That's why um, quite often I, I teach on the Psalms. I find the book of Psalms a wonderful guide to learning how to pray. But the other good place to learn to pray in the Bible is the epistles and the prayers of Paul. Uh, perhaps some of you um, read Don Carson's book, A Call to Spiritual Reformation. I don't know if you remember that book. It had the worst cover ever um, by IVP, but the book was gold dust just going through the prayers of Jesus, because uh, prayers of Paul, because there's so much we can, we can learn. And so um, as we're in RBT Ephesians this month, I thought I had two weeks, so I'd do, uh, there's two prayers in Ephesians, so I thought I'd look at the first prayer tonight, and then the second prayer um, next week, and really use it as a, a guide to prayer. How can we learn to pray um, with these um, prayers in Ephesians? Now, if you look at the prayer, um, it starts with the word for. Uh, which means you shouldn't really read that without reading what comes before it. It's, it's a linking word. And really the four is the fuel. The four is the fuel. So the fuel to his prayer actually isn't in the prayer, but it's before the prayer. So let's have a little look before the prayer. Ephesians chapter 1, you get this uh, long sentence in verse um, 3 to 14, where Paul just is rattling off all of these blessings and it's, it's like a child on Christmas morning. You know when they find a stocking and they get quite large sometimes, don't they? And they can't stop opening the stocking. Now, some of you maybe have children or grandchildren who are very measured and they'll take one toy at a time. And I wish I had those kind of kids. Might like just keep going, keep going. And, and that's what Paul does with the blessings. So let's read through and see the blessings. Chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Every spiritual blessing? Yes, every. Let me list it for you. So he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which, which he's freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of sins, all of our sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. I love that, isn't it? That forgiveness we have isn't just the forgiveness he decided to give us out of his riches, but the forgiveness, is, forgiveness he gave us according to his riches. This is rich forgiveness. And so he has lavished it on us. What a lovely word, lavished ever thought of that some people are just they'll give you things but they apportion it he lavishes this love and he does it with all wisdom and understanding he's made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure if you notice this good pleasure god enjoys this god isn't saving us grumpily he's loving it and so which he's purposed in christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under christ well that must be all things that must be every spiritual blessing no paul's going to keep going verse 11 in him we were also chosen having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we who were the first to put our hope in christ might also be for the praise of his glory and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. A seal. You are his. Here's the seal. And the seal is the promised Holy Spirit, who is now a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. I used to go to a fish and chip shop when I was a little boy in Brunaman. And every once in a while you'd go there, there would have been a long queue and there wasn't quite enough chips for our family. Not making any comments on our family, but they had to make more chips. And I remember as a little boy, I'd be sat on the counter. I don't think you'd be allowed to do that today in health and safety. And the lady in the fish and chip shop would always give me one chip on a little wooden stick. And I'd always love that one chip because it was the deposit guaranteeing the fact that I was going to have a big bag of chips. I loved it. The Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. 
until the redemption of those who are for God's possession, to the praise of his glory, for this reason, for this reason. So when it comes to prayer, whatever prayer is, and very often prayer comes in response to circumstances. It's one of the things the book of Psalms teaches us. Often, one of the best ways to come to prayer is just being honest about what's happening. How long, O Lord? How long? We can do that. But as well, one of the best ways to come to praise is praise, is thanksgiving. Coming with a heart full of what God has done for this reason that's the first thing he comes and really what he does in this prayer this is my understanding of the prayer that comes now what he's doing is praying that that list of blessings in verses 3 to 14 will be unpacked i think that's what he's praying i think he's praying that we wouldn't be like a child on christmas morning who pulls everything out of the stocking and then forgets it and goes off wanting something else but we'd go back to every single gift in that stocking pull it out, inspect it, learn to play with it, understand what it is and enjoy it, enjoy it. Part of the problem, I think, for us as Christians and for me is that God has given me everything that I need. He's given me every spiritual blessing in Christ and then I'm asking for other spiritual blessings. God's going, they're all there. (laughs) I've given them to you. One of our greatest problems in, in Christian life is not a lack of blessing, but a lack of acquaintedness with those blessings. I'm quoting someone there, and I have no idea who I'm quoting, so please let me say, I know I've stolen that, but I don't know who from. That is the great, let's say Packer. It sounds like a J.A. Packer thing, doesn't it? It's not the blessings we lack, but our acquaintedness with them. So the first thing he does is, in response to this gospel, is he thanks. Here's the first thing we see, thanks. Verses 15 to 16. He says, for this reason... Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my praise and prayers. The first thing to remember in prayer is we need to praise God and give thanks. And we need to make sure that we don't forget that. And it's interesting, how does he know they're Christians? Because he's praising God for giving them all of those blessings. I wonder, how does he know? Do you ever wonder that? How do I know if I'm a Christian? I think there's lots of different evidences for faith, but it's interesting the two he picks on. He says, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus, so there's the gospel, there's the doctrine, you've put your faith in the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, the one who's died for us, and your love for God's people. It's an interesting evidence of grace, isn't it? (laughs) Can you imagine if someone came to me and said, I don't know if I'm saved or not, and said, well, how do you treat other Christians? (laughs) I'd be a bit nervous. But actually... That is the natural outworking of Christianity. That's why I love looking out on an evening like this, and most on a Sunday morning, because there's lots of different ages and stages as well. But, but you should look out in a church and go, how are these people in a room together? It's because of Jesus, and we love one another. And so he thanks God for that. And then he says, I never stop praying for you, which is wonderful. And then he tells them the prayer. So the prayer comes in verse 17. Verse 17, I love this verse. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation so that you may know him better. This is the heart of the prayer. You've got these blessings, but what I want is for you to know God better. Do you realise you can know God better? It's an interesting thing, isn't it? Even the one who knows God. Elsewhere in Philippians, Paul will say that he knows God, but he says he wants to know him more. He wants to know him more. You see, it's not about what has been given, but the one who has given it. We don't just want to look at the gifts, but the giver. It's a wonderful thing. If you think about this as a bit of a strange birthday present, but can you imagine if an abandoned child for their birthday got adopted? I know there's a whole host of problems with that, but can you imagine that was their birthday present? It just so happened that their adoption day was their birthday. Before that, all of the loneliness and uncertainty, but then someone comes and signs all the paperwork, agrees to take over and care for them for the rest of their life. It would be an amazing gift but it would be a gift for far more than a birthday. It would take that child the rest of their life to get to know the one or the couple who has come to adopt them. 
It would be something to get to know God better. And we are just the same. We need to know God better. I think um, when it comes to getting to know God better, um, we've got to understand um, different types of know. Now, in English, we only have one word for know, don't we? Which is always frustrating. Um, so it's very rare that I give you a Welsh lesson. I found out this week, I don't know if you know this, but Chan speaks Welsh. We all had a bit of a shock in the office when Chan just starts speaking Welsh. Turns out uh, she's the best Welsh speaker in the office. Now, in Welsh, Sean, there are two... I'm going to test you now. Let's find out how good you are. Uh, two words for know in Welsh. I am gwybod an adnabod. There we are. See, we can have good fun now. So, to gwybod something is to know something. I can know that this is a lectern. It's a fact. I gwybod. But adnabod is to know someone. I know them. It's relational. It's, it's personal. That's a, a simple way of thinking about those two things. And when it comes to God, we can know God. We can know about God. We can say God in three persons, blessed Trinity. We can say God is sovereign and God is good. Those are good things to know, but we also know God. We also know God. Now, we can't draw a wedge between those two things. That's where trouble comes. The trouble is when you draw a wedge between Gwybod and Adnabod. But actually, the both are completely connected and intertwined. So you can't really know someone unless you know them. <laughs> So can you imagine tonight now, if I stood up here and in an illustration spoke about my wife and said, you know, what I love about my wife the most is her red hair and Welsh accent. You'd all be saying, I don't think you know your wife, do you? (laughs) If you know someone, you know them. You know about them. And the more you get to know about them, the more you know them. And so it is with God. We need to know God personally, but that is not different from knowing facts about God. Now, it is possible to separate them. People can put God into a systematic theology and study all about him, but never know him. That's dangerous. But actually, if you truly want to know God, you will know all about him. So he's praying that we would know God better. That must be personally and in our understanding of him. And he prays for two things, which I think sometimes kind of freaks us out a bit. He prays, verse 17, for a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Now, straight away, everybody bounces away from this, which I find fascinating. As soon as you see spirit of wisdom and revelation, we all go, well, that must be something mystical and charismatic, John. Because it wouldn't be that God would be clever and wise enough to write a book and give us the author of the book in our heart so we could get to know him correctly. Turns out God is pretty wise. (laughs) See, the amazing thing is, is the God who wrote this Bible wrote it, as I often say, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever thought of the three things the Holy Spirit does with the Bible? So the first thing the Holy Spirit does with the Bible is he inspires it. So concursive, he works with the authors of the Bible to make sure that when the authors wrote the Bible, they wrote God's words. They were their words, but at that time in writing the Bible, they were writing the very words of God. That wasn't to do with everything they did. I don't think St. Paul's shopping list was scriptural, or Jeremiah's uh, letters to various people was canonical. But at the time that the Holy Spirit moved them, as they were moved along by the Spirit, when they wrote the words, they wrote the very words of God. So how you deal with this book is how you deal with God. They are his words. Don't we ever thought about that? Uh, we call this speech act theory in a kind of literature world or in a drama world, which is that actually to speak is to act, and words have authority. So if I take my phone now and text one of my boys and say, can you do this by the time I get home? If when I get home, I say, have you done it? And they say, no. And they say, because you only sent it in a text, I will go, you're grounded. Because my words have authority. They may be separate from me, but they still have my authority. And so God has inspired the Bible through the Holy Spirit. The second thing the Holy Spirit has done, which I love, is the Holy Spirit has ensured that the Bible has been kept over the years. Isn't that wonderful? The Bible written over thousands of years ago, But yet, here it is. It has been kept. It has been guarded. So the Holy Spirit has guarded the Bible and made sure we have people who can translate the Bible for us so we can make sure that it's accurate and we can read it. 
But the third thing that God does through his Holy Spirit, which is so important, is he illuminates. He illuminates. I, I love this. He illuminates. So because the Holy Spirit has written the Bible, and when you become a Christian, what is the Holy Spirit? The deposit guaranteeing your inheritance. He dwells within you. It means that when we read the Bible, the Holy Spirit is the author sitting within us, and he illuminates, he sheds light upon the Bible. It's like if you've ever read a book with an author. Have you ever done that? Um, when I sat out in ministry, the guy I was an assistant to, Kev, he wrote a book on the 1904 revival. And I remember him working on the book, and he would read me sections of the book, and the book would come alive. And actually, even now, if I read the book, I can hear Kev's voice. It's really bizarre, just because I know him. He doesn't live in my heart, funnily enough, but because I know him. And that means that for the believer, when we read the Bible, actually, it is a miraculous, supernatural, spiritual experience. Because the Holy Spirit who inspired it is illuminating us. Interestingly, more and more, I'm becoming obsessed with formal prayers of illumination, if anybody's interested in such things. Um, I'm collecting a whole raft of them. Uh, last week before I preached, I actually prayed a formal prayer of illumination. I'm enjoying finding John Calvin and the Book of Common Prayer and all of these different prayers of illumination, because I think it's important to remember that when we read the Bible, God is speaking to us, and he's going to illuminate us. And so actually, this spirit of wisdom and of revelation is of God's knowledge and wisdom being revealed to us. And I think that is primarily done through the scriptures. Primarily done through the scriptures. Because in the end, what do we need to know God better? We need to understand verses 3 to 14. He's listed the blessings. The great danger for us as Christians is earlier on we're talking about this, it's not our lack of blessing, our lack of acquaintedness with them, but the other problem is we just aren't interested in God's blessings. <laughs> He's given us everything else, and we're going, yeah, but there must be something else. I want this other thing. Actually, the best thing we can do is look at what God gives us. We need to know and get to know him better. Talking of getting things about my wife wrong, like a hair colour and an accent, this is a, a true story. When we were first married, uh, two very embarrassing things happened. Um, the first was I was invited to preach back in the church I'd been at, Minster Church in, in Cardiff, and we'd only been married about five months. And as I went up the front, they said, hey, John, we've asked Beck some questions, and we're going to do a Mr. and Mrs. Anybody want to guess how many questions they got right? <laughs> Zero. It was a very awkward sermon. Then, a few months later, when it came to Christmas, uh, this is a true story, um, I bought Beck a remote control car and a disco ball. I, I thought it was funny. She didn't. I knew Beck, I knew her well enough to get married, but I know not to buy a remote control car and a disco ball now, because I know her more. We've been together longer. And it's exactly the same with the Lord. We need to get to know the Lord. And the way we get to know the Lord is with a spirit of wisdom and revelation. The work of the Spirit illuminating our hearts and minds to understand him from his word. I would say that the more we learn about God, the more we grow to know him better. We will grow in intimacy with God. That's the prayer that he says is, I want you to know him better. It's a great thing to pray for other people. When you pray through the church members list um, or when you pray for different people in church, sometimes you're wondering, what shall I pray for? Here's a great prayer. I pray that they would know you better. That's brilliant, isn't it? Sometimes it's good to pray to God and say, God, in what way do they need to know you better? It's interesting, isn't it? Because God is sovereign. God is so much more than us. We're not getting to know a God that we can study at GCSE level and get 100% and then go, done God, got a GCSE in God. There's so much about God. So you think, we preach every week. We read the Bible every day. But yet, with every passing year, looking out tonight, with every passing decade, is it not true to say that there are new things about God? 
things you never realised. And at different seasons in life, in different situations in life, a different, different aspect of God's character just comes to the fore. So perhaps this morning, for example, you know, the words that Jesus is gentle and lowly spoke to us. Sometimes that's what we need to know more about God. We need to know that he is gentle and lowly. And he says here that actually what he wants to pray for them, verse 18, is that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope. So there's the interesting enlightenment, this illumination. And what's interesting here is he talks about the eyes of your heart. It's a fascinating kind of comment, isn't it? What are the eyes of your heart? Well, it's basically what you see from your heart and what you embrace, not just in your head, but in your heart. What drives you? What comes into the, the seat of your person? What comes into the engine of your affections? Not just mere emotions, but the emotions that drive your passions and your habits and your convictions. What do we see in our hearts? Well, he prays that the eyes of our heart would be enlightened. That's what we need. Have we ever read a book in an evening? Perhaps you do it over the summer um, when you read outside, you know, on a warm summer evening, and you're reading outside, and it's fine. And then after a while, you're thinking, the print on this book is getting quite small. And it's not that the print on the book is getting small, it's just that dusk has come, and it's getting darker and darker and darker. It comes very slowly. I think the reality is for us as Christians is we get seasons in our faith when it's as if the print on the Bible gets smaller, as if knowing God gets harder. And part of that is actually the eyes of our heart are growing dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. Sometimes it's the clouds of sin coming in. Charles Simeon, Cambridge, used to use this illustration. And he used to talk about the way that when you try and read a sundial, if a cloud comes and blocks the sun, can't read the time and in the same way when clouds of sin comes into our life we struggle to read the bible and so what should we do we should pray that the eyes of our heart are opened that those clouds of sin are dispersed and that we can hear and see him and when we do that what does he want us to know he wants us to know hope verse 18 he wants us to know the hope that he's called us to the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people hope is wonderful isn't it i guess the hope first off is verses um, 3 to 14 the hope of the gospel that we've been chosen adopted forgiven given heaven and the holy spirit as a guarantee hope for many of us and always is but sometimes more so the fact that when we die we'll spend eternity with him hope is trusting that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Hope is what we celebrate in the communion table when we say that all of our sins are forgiven. We have a great hope. They're things that we can't see, but yet when we read them in scripture, we believe them. And it's a wonderful hope. And really what we pray for is that when we read the Bible, the Holy Spirit, as he illuminates our hearts and minds, would help us to see the hope, would see the hope. Really what we're praying for is that the Bible would, even though it's always alive, would come super alive. Super alive. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes you want to put a super before a word to make it more so. And I think as Christians we need to learn to do that. It's not just abundant, but it's super abundant. So if you think of light decreasing, and so it makes it harder to read, I change the illustration now to a stained glass window. So you can see a stained glass window with the lights on in the building, and that looks nice. But when the sun shines through a stained glass window, and they're seen as they're designed to be seen, then the, the view and the emotion is so much greater. And there is a sense, you must have experienced this. Have there been experiences in your Christian life where reading the Bible on your own or hearing the Bible taught in a small group or in a Sunday morning or in a conference, a passage which has always just been, yeah, that's good, 
or even maybe less precious to me, becomes, <gasps> I don't think I can breathe. Sometimes, do you ever see that? A passage you read? I felt a couple of weeks ago when we had Christian Demond preaching and he went over the parable of the, 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 the prodigal son. I was just sitting there. I was going to leave to have a little tour of Sunday school and I couldn't leave. I was just like, this is amazing. How can you take a part of scripture that we've all heard preached a million times and then go, wow. It's the prayer. It's the spirit. It's the light coming through the stained glass window. And we need to pray for it and we need to enjoy it because as we do it, we get to know God more and it helps us. It builds our hope. Now, can God do this? Well, he reminds us, yes, he can. Verses 19 to 23. He says this, look, we want to have a, a hope, a glorious inheritance, and he'll do it with his incomparably great power for those of us who believe. So what he does now is he focuses on power. So, right, do we believe that God can do this? Well, we can if we realise the power that he has. It's the power, verse 19, that is the same as the mighty strength that God used to raise Christ from the dead. Think about that. When you read the Bible, there is resurrection power to help you understand the Bible. Now, that changes Bible study, doesn't it? <laughs> That changes your prayer of illumination. Your prayer of illumination is no longer help me understand the Bible. The prayer of illumination is by your power that raised Jesus from the dead. Open my eyes. Help me see hope. Here's the question. How often do we go expecting that? <laughs> Maybe if you're like me, Sometimes it's just, well, I've got to do my daily Bible reading, so let's do it. I just want to get through it. And sometimes when we're in some difficult books in the Old Testament, you know when you're halfway through a load of woes and judgment and you're going, really? We need to pray with faith. We need to pray prayers of illumination because God can do far more. And as we read, he will reveal himself and we'll get to know him. You see, how do you get to know God better? I'm going to say it really is as simple as reading the Bible prayerfully. I think, I think that's it. I think anything more than that is overcomplicating it. It's coming to the Bible with faith that God has written it and God will speak to me through it and he will change my life. God can do other way, things and speak in other ways. Please don't think that I'm limiting God to a specific kind of page in the bible but this is primarily how he speaks to us and when we do that he will open up that list of blessings from verses 3 to 14 so if like me you are a student of prayer can i encourage you to do two things in in your praying pray with the bible open that's the first thing don't separate bible reading and prayer so as you read the Bible, pray. And as you pray, pray the Bible. Don't go, I'm going to read my Bible, close it, and now I'm going to pray. Read the Bible prayerfully. Lord, open my eyes. Lord, reveal yourself to me. Lord, by the power that raised your son from the dead, give me life. And as you pray, why not tomorrow morning pray through verses 3 to 14? Lord, I thank you that you've chosen me that you've predestined me, that you love me, that you've lavished your grace upon me. And why not pray that for other people, people in your family, perhaps people who haven't come to know the Lord yet or have wandered away from the faith. Lord, open their eyes. Remind them that you gave your only son for them. Help them to see that you will want to lavish your love upon them. Help them to know that you have a plan for them. It's a great way to pray for people. So pray and read the Bible together. Let me pray and then I'll hand back over to Tim. Father, we thank you for this wonderful prayer. And Father, we thank you for this wonderful list of blessings in the first chapter. Gracious Heavenly Father, would you open our eyes to see more of who you are, to understand what Jesus has done for us and who we are 
in him. Father, we desire to have the eyes of our heart opened so that we can know you better. Father, we thank you for your lavish love. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen.